Hello and welcome to another slice of Daily Bread. I'm so glad that you've joined me today for Daily Bread. Now before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for your many blessings. And I pray that as we open your word and study just a little bit of it today, that your spirit will bless us and guide us into all truth. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Recently, my daughter went to a birthday party. Now, she's been to several birthday parties, and I don't know if it's just her friends or what the deal, if it's a new trend, but it seems like every birthday party she goes to, she comes home with a gift bag. It's, it's almost like each, uh, there's a theme with the birthday party, and they give all of the ch children that attend the party a little gift bag. Normally, you just take a gift to the person that's having the birthday, and you don't really always get something back. Now, I don't ever remember going to a birthday party where you get a little bit of a gift bag. Usually it's just little trinkets that don't usually last a whole lot. But recently, I said my daughter went to a birthday party and she came home with a fish in a fish bowl. And you can see the fish here swimming around in its little fish globe. This is the actual fish and the actual globe that she came home with. Now, when she came home with that, I was a little concerned. I don't know how to take care of fish. I've never in my life taken care of fish in a fish tank or anything at home. And we weren't sure, my wife and I weren't sure what we wanted to do with this fish. We weren't sure we really wanted to keep it and take care of it. We were trying to figure out if we should pawn it off on somebody else. But in the process, we could see that our daughter really enjoyed watching the fish. She enjoyed feeding the fish and kind of grew a little bit of attached to this fish. They had named the fish Cheeto. They had given all the fish, they'd given everybody at the party a fish. And this one was named Cheeto. Well, she has a cartoon that she enjoys watching and she, and in that cartoon, the person has a fish called Goldie. And so she kept calling this fish Goldie, not Cheeto. But we were just trying to figure out what should we do with this fish. And we saw how much of, of a blessing it was to our daughter. And so we finally decided, you know what, let's go ahead and keep the fish. But if we're going to keep the fish, we need to put it in a better home. So we went to the pet store and we bought an aquarium and we bought rocks and decorations. And then we figured, well, the fish, we don't want it to be lonely. And it was at this point we learned that what we had was a female betta fish. And so we're trying to figure out and learn how to take care of this fish, how to change the water, when to feed it, how much to feed it, what to feed it, how much you're supposed to change the water out, when you're supposed to clean the tank, what's the water temperatures, all these different things that we had to learn of how to take care of this fish. We learned that bettas usually do better by themselves. And so the, the aquarium we got had a divider in it and we bought a male betta fish and we have the female betta fish. And it's been a blessing to have this fish. Initially we were a little skeptical, but now we're actually happy to have little fish in the house that we can, that we can look at on a, on a regular basis. And I think we've named the other one Cheeto. So we have Cheeto and Goldie now. So with this whole experience, I've kind of been thinking about fish a lot lately. And I was reminded of the symbol, the Christian symbol, the Christian fish symbol. You can see it here on the screen. Something similar to this. You see it on the bumper cars and all that. And I, I got to thinking, where in the world did this come from? What, what prompted this symbol? And in my research, I found out this was created about the first century. During persecution, they would use this symbol to let people know that it was a friend that was there and not. It was just a way to identify as a Christian. And this also would be a symbol that the other people would be unaware of. And, and I heard also where you would have two people meeting on the road and someone would draw the first little thing on the dust and then the, person, the other person would draw the other half. But wh why, why a fish? There's several stories in the Bible and we believe maybe because of those stories and 
and that the disciples, there was at least four disciples that were fishermen. And so that's probably where the symbol of the fish came from to, to symbolize Christianity. So what fish stories do we find in the Bible? Well, in the creation account, we see that fish were created on the fifth day. And then a little bit later in the Old Testament, you have uh, God letting his people know what kind of fish he can, they can eat and which fish are unclean and you can't eat. And then really the only other story found in the Old Testament regarding fish is the story of Jonah and the whale. My, my daughter does enjoy the story of Jonah and the whale. But some of you are probably saying, well, it's a whale, it's not a fish. Well, let's take a look at Jonah 1, verse number 17. It says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So the Bible clearly states that this was a fish, a great fish, a big fish, and we probably uh, give it uh, the idea of it's a whale because that's the biggest fish that we are aware of. Now there's other stories found in the New Testament. We have the parable of the net that Jesus told. There's the feeding of the 5,000. There's the feeding of the 4,000. And then there's another story where Jesus tells Peter to go fishing and in the fish's mouth was a coin to pay Jesus' temple tax and Peter's temple tax. And then we get to the story that we're going to look at here today on Daily Bread. And this story is actually told twice. It's two, the miracle of the great catch of fish, which we're going to look at, happens twice, not once, but twice. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry and just before he goes back to heaven, he repeats that exact same miracle. But we're going to look in detail at the one at the beginning of his ministry. So if you have your Bibles, let's go to Luke chapter 1, or excuse me, Luke 5, verse 1. So it was as the multitude pressed about to hear him, to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake Gennesaret. So here Jesus is standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he's got a huge multitude of people around him. Now the lake of Gennesaret was just another way of saying the Sea of Galilee. Now, Desire of Ages paints the story like this on page 244. Jesus had come to spend a quiet hour by the waterside. In the early morning, he hoped for a little season of rest from the multitude that followed him day after day. But soon the people began to gather about him. Their numbers rapidly increased so that he was pressed upon all sides. So Jesus has gone to the Sea of Galilee to get rest from all of the crowds that are constantly following him. But they're following him, so he gets this big crowd around him, and it's hard for him to preach and teach and be with the people with them all so close in around him. So he finds a solution, and we find that solution in verse number 2 of Luke 5. And saw, so Jesus saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. So Jesus sees these two boats, and he's able to get in one and go out a little bit from the shore, so that he is able to preach effectively to the people. This gave him the opportunity to see the whole crowd and talk to the whole crowd, rather than just those little bit that's crowded around him. Now, the Bible doesn't say how long he taught the people, but it does tell us what happened after he had finished preaching. So verse 4 says, When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. So Jesus is finishing preaching. He's done. And he turns to Peter and he says, Peter, what I want you to do is go out fishing out into the deep out into the deep where the fish are. That's where the fish are. You don't find too many fish up around the shores of the Sea of Galilee. I remember recently we went to Maui on a violin praise uh, tour, and we were there. We had some time to do some snorkeling, and we went out to the ocean there, 
and you did not see any any of the fish up there in the area. It was out quite a ways before you found any good fish to do some good, decent snorkeling. And so that's what Jesus is saying is here's a fish are way out in the deep. You need to launch out there to do some fishing. Now look at Peter's response found in verse number five. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Peter's probably thinking when Jesus tell him, tells him to launch out into the deep, this is a bad idea. He's probably thinking, you know, you're a carpenter. You learned from your father how to be a carpenter. And I grew up and learned about fishing. I know how fishing is done. You don't have a clue how fishing is done. Fishing in that time was done at night because the fish, they, they look up, they can't see the, the, the net. And so they get caught in the net very easily. Now daytime, the middle of the day where, where Jesus is actually encouraging them to go out fishing, it's daytime. It's the worst time to go fishing. The fish can see the net and they go, you know what? I'm not going there. They stay away because they don't want to get caught in the net. But look at this. Peter's probably thinking that. He doesn't say it. He, he's kind of inferring that with his, well, we've fished all night and haven't caught anything. But he says, you know what? At your word, I will go ahead and do it. At your word. So this is what happens when he follows the word of Jesus. Verse number six of Luke five says, and when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. This was probably the largest haul of fish that they had ever seen. It was so full that the nets were beginning to break. They couldn't hold it. And they called James and John, come on over. We need some help with this fish that we're catching. And they filled both of the boats with fish and they began to sink because there was so much fish in the boat. So what is Peter's response? When he sees what the Lord has done, when he sees the miracle of the large catch, what does he, what does he say? What does he do? Luke chapter 5, verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Peter realizes who Christ is. He realizes he is the Messiah, his divinity. And at the same time, he realizes that Peter is unworthy to be in Christ's presence. And so he falls down at Jesus' feet and he says, Depart from me, I'm a sinful man. Desire of Ages states it in this manner, that Peter was falling down, clinging to Jesus' feet while he was saying this. He was basically saying, leave, but at the same time, he's hanging on to Jesus' feet. Don't go. I don't want you to leave. He's saying one thing, but doing another thing with his body language. And Jesus' response can be found in verse number 10. It says, and Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. Desire of Ages, page 246, commenting on this exact scenario has this to say about Simon, Peter, or Simon, Andrew, James, and John. It says, until this time, none of the disciples had fully united as co-laborers with Jesus. They had witnessed many of his miracles and had listened to his teaching but they had not entirely forsaken their former employment. The imprisonment of John the Baptist had been to them all a bitter disappointment. If such, to were, be, if such were to be the outcome of John's mission, they could have little hope for their master. With all the religious leaders combined against him, under the circumstances it was a relief to them to return for a short time to their fishing. But now Jesus called them to forsake their former life and unite their interests with his. Peter had accepted the call. Upon reaching the shore, Jesus bade the other three disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, 
they left all and followed him. Before asking them to leave their nets and fishing boats, Jesus had given them assurance that God would supply their needs. So in this scenario, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, they had been with Jesus a little bit. They had seen some of his miracles, but they hadn't completely forsaken their former life. These disciples were worried about their earthly needs. They, they just wanted to make sure that everything would be okay here on this earth. Jesus proved through his miracle, through this exact miracle, that he could and he would supply their needs. They didn't need to worry about what was to come. God had their back and God and Jesus would be with them. Now I mentioned that this miracle was repeated a second time. It was at the beginning of Jesus' ministry when he called the disciples and we find it again at the end in John 21. We find this exact miracle repeated, almost identical. Desire of Ages on page 810, talking about the second catch of fish, says this, Vividly they recalled the scene beside the sea when Jesus had bidden them follow him. They remembered how at his command they had launched out into the deep and had let down their net and the catch had been so abundant as to fill the net even to breaking. Then Jesus had called them to leave their fishing boats and had promised to make them fishers of men. It was to bring this scene to their minds and to deepen its impression that he had again performed the miracle. His act was a renewal of the commission to them to the disciples. It showed them that the death of their master had not lessened their obligation to do the work he had assigned them. Though they were to be deprived of his personal companionship and of the means of support by their former employment, the risen Savior would still have care for them. While they were doing his work, he would provide for their needs. And Jesus had a purpose in bidding them cast their net on the right side of the ship. On that side, he stood upon the shore. That was the side of faith. If they had labored in connection with him, his divine power combining with their human effort, they could not fail of success. At the end of Jesus' ministry, they're wanting, they're wondering what's going to happen now that Jesus has risen and he's going to head back to heaven. They, they were uncertain. But Jesus wanted to make certain that the disciples understood that things hadn't changed. No matter how thing turns, things turned out, he would be with them. And you know, I think about it. Jesus calls you and me to be fishers of men as well. And I know some people are like, well, that's the job for the pastors. They're the ones that are go, supposed to go out and do all the fishing. They're the ones that are supposed to be launching out into the deep to catch fish. We as lay people don't need to do that. But God is calling each one of us to be fishers of men. Desire of Ages, page 249, says this, The deeper lesson which the miracle conveyed for the disciples is a lesson for us also, that he whose word could gather the fishes from the sea could also impress human hearts and draw them by the cords of his love so that his servants might become fishers of men. We don't need to worry about what is happening. We just need to be out there fishing, 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 letting God work on their hearts to bring them closer to Him. You know, some of us might feel, you know, I'm not quite worthy to do this. I have a checkered past that's pretty bad. God, He doesn't want me. Well, there's no limit. Desire of Ages, page 250 says, There is no limit to the usefulness of one who by putting self aside makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit upon his heart and lives a life wholly consecrated to God. When we consecrate and commit our lives to God, he will work with us through the fishing process. So how about it, friends? God is calling you and me to be fishers of men. He bids us to follow. Are we going to follow or are we going to go our own way? I encourage each one of you and myself as well to be true fishers of men. Shall we pray? 
Lord, you're calling. You're calling each one of us to be fishers of men. It's difficult sometimes when we look at the circumstances, we wonder if we would be good fishermen. But we have read in your inspired writings that you will be with us and we will do effective work for you. So Lord, we just pray that you would help us to take up the task of being fishers of men so that one day soon when you return, we can have plenty of fish ready for the kingdom. Thank you in Jesus' name, amen.